My wife and I moved from Chicago just over a year ago now. I was fortunate to have great parents um, raise us in the church, in a non-denominational Christian church growing up. Got very involved in the youth ministry, youth group, and all that great stuff. So uh, became a Christian early on, actually at a, a youth event that my cousin Jackie and uh, her at that time, I believe, boyfriend, now they've been married 15 years now. Um, the moment where I saw an arena full of people lifting their arms to the Lord and it was just, the, the spirit was present and it was like, this is real. And so I think that was the moment I really committed to being a Christian and following the Lord. Um, of course, a lot of hiccups along the way. And I think that we have a way to sort of wander and not live every single day uh, for the Lord. And I found myself in really good opportunities in the work I was doing and working for a, a guy out in uh, Western Illinois. And uh, he had a big financial practice and he kind of brought me in as the junior. And, and it was just this rose colored glasses of, oh, look at all this opportunity, like one day, that's gonna be me, right? One day I'm gonna have all that. It, it was something where I always wanted to do well financially. I always wanted to have business success in that way. And that's what I was chasing. I was making a great income and it was paying our bills and I was saving for retirement. You know, I'm like, I'm trying to get the best head start that I could possibly have. But uh, we had bought a house and uh, had a basement flood twice, uh, had, just, you know, a lot of a lot of things come up that was unexpected. You know, the second day we bought the house, we moved in. It was the coldest day of the year in Chicago. It was negative 20 with wind chill. It was during that uh, polar vortex, I think they called it. And then our furnace uh, went out the second day. So it was like, welcome to homeownership. Here's $5,000 that you weren't planning on. I, again, I remember just struggling and, and internally and then talking to my wife and saying, what, like, Lord, what is happening? Like, why, why one thing after the next? Because it really felt like a snowball. Um, never actually had been to Sarasota and we found a place available for rent. And we said, my wife found me and said, call these people, I gotta, gotta find the place. So we called them up and turned out they were uh, the in-laws of Shea Vossler. So we got the place, um, we rented it, which is awesome. And because of the connection with Shea, we decided to come to 360. So that was sort of our introduction to the church. Uh, we came here, loved it. And I met uh, David Lazeski on my first uh, day here. He was a greeter that day, just welcoming people. And he told me about the men's group uh, the 212 group, we work out every other Saturday and, you know, do the study with uh, one of the connect groups. So he got me involved there. And then little did I know, just a matter of weeks into it, uh, struck up a great relationship with David, who uh, is now my discipleship partner. So I uh, have had such a blessed experience uh, getting to know David. I was very inspired by his testimony and his story on uh, you know, walking away from the lifestyle he was in and turning to the Lord. And, you know, he walked away from uh, the LGBT lifestyle. Uh, and that immediately was like, wow, that's such a difficult thing to do. And, and I was just impressed with his story. But beyond that, um, he walked away from a lot of business, wealth, money. And, and that just struck a chord in my heart. Um, a guy who seemingly had everything the world could offer. And once he, you know, was pursuing Christ, he basically had to put a lot of it away uh, and wanted to and willingly laid that down. And so I know the Lord was um, timing that perfectly because man, when you just let the walls come down, you can look back at these moments of the Lord and say, thank you, because there's not a chance I would have ever thought we found the townhouse to rent. And from that made a connection to 360, that we would have been able to purchase the townhome, praise the Lord, after a year time and find a place to, to land on our feet here in Florida. Or that I would have met my disciple maker, David, and that he happened to walk through things in his own life and walk with the Lord 
that spoke to me in such a substantial and impactful way to where it felt like his story was just speaking directly to me. I was like, this David's story is for many people. It's for everyone to see the glory of God and what he's done. But in that moment, I felt like this is for me, like the Lord is talking directly at me on look at this person's life and all that I've walked him through. And now watch me do the same for you. Incredible. We start a new collection today, and uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm excited for it because it it's going to be multi-angled, and it it we're talking about silence in the Bible, and there are just some unbelievable, fascinating moments of silence in the Bible. We talk about a lot of what's said, but what is not said. Uh, I think you're really going to be uh, moved by a lot of these moments, and so. Uh, just really eager to to jump in today. What we've seen in the in the the experience of this baptism is so related to what we're going to talk about, because today we're going to talk about truth. And truth these days, I don't know if you've noticed, has become more elastic. But truth is not elastic. It's like saying cement is elastic, I, and it's just not. But truth has, in our culture, has become a thing that is almost so relevant to people, but truth is not relevant. Truth is absolute. Truth is not subjective. Truth doesn't move. Concrete is concrete. And so I know you all know what we're getting at here. And so it doesn't matter. You can pick a topic, whether it's science, whether it's religion, whether it's business, and it's really difficult in, anymore to know what truth is. And so um, you experience this every day of your life, probably. You get, a, you get a letter in the mail. On the outside of the letter, it says, urgent, <laughs> open now. And so I, you open it, and it's nothing, right? I mean, it's not urgent. It's not important. It's not even true. And I think, what a great way to start a business relationship. I want to call your business because our first step was deceit. So I, I can't wait. You know, does anybody call these places, right? So, you know, so it, it's everyday life. So there's some things that are deeper. There's some things that are everyday life. Like, okay, I got a couple more photos to show you. So is this a taxi or a police car? <laughs> And maybe it's like the guy, you know, has a midnight job as a taxi. <laughs> so you don't know, you know, does he, if he shows up, if he's going to give you a ride to where you want to go or a ride down to the prison, you know, you're not quite, quite sure. And here, I just have a couple. So uh, two words, spicy popcorn chicken. <laughs> It seems like three words, but maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe like spicy chicken is like one word or something. I don't know. Do I have your attention? <laughs> Jesus was standing in his last days before Pilate. And we think things are new, but Solomon taught us there's nothing new under the sun. Jesus answered when he was saying, hey, our, when Pilate said, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you're right in saying I'm a king. You just got the wrong location. He said, in fact, for this reason, I was born. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. And for this, I came into the world. Why? To testify to the truth, to the anchor to set the world, to recalibrate the world, because the world has made truth elastic, even way before Jesus came, to testify the truth. And then he says the statement, everybody, everybody on the side of truth. Oh, wait, it's a little revelation here. 
There's a side of truth. There's a lane of truth. He says, everyone on the side of truth will listen to me. And then Pilate says, hey, wait a minute, what is truth? You see how relevant the Bible is? That was spoken 2,000 years ago, and we're still asking the same question as a culture. Wait a minute, what is truth? I mean, is, is Jesus truth? Is the Bible truth? Is, are, you know, what is, what is true? As politics seem to get amped up, I mean, honestly, I don't know what's true. I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm a conservative, unashamedly, but there's sometimes on both sides of the aisle, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know who's speaking what any longer on what show and what commentary they're giving. And so Jesus says there's a side of truth, then there's a side of untruth. Now, when we watch the TV, we get the news, we, you know, we get the junk mail, we do all that. That seems so surface. It seems so physical. But what Jesus is saying, that there's a backstage to this whole thing we call life. And he opens up the back of that stage, pulls the curtain back at times where we like, here's what's really going on. This is not about junk mail, advertising, police taxi cars. It's not, it's not about politicians. It's something much deeper. And, and I don't know this is heavy, but Jesus in John chapter 8 says, the devil has been a murderer from the very beginning not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. Zero truth. When he lies, he's speaking his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. So we begin to understand, if you just step back from culture, and I know it's heavy, and if the supernatural world to you is a new world that you've only had your mind in the natural world, I understand. It was for me when I first started exploring God, and the, the moments like, wow, there's there's a backstage to this whole thing that we're seeing, our houses, our jobs, our cars, the chair you're sitting, the clothes we're wearing. This is all natural, right? This visible. There's an invisible world. And it is as real as the, in, in fact, it's more real because it's going to be long lasting. That chair one day is going to wear out. Your clothes are going to wear out. Your house is going to wear out. Josh proved that with his furnace. His furnace wore out, right? Everything is going to wear out, so it's really not even real. The real thing is the thing that lasts forever, and that's what's generating this. Jesus said, look, or Peter said this, you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. So here, so we're kind of setting the stage today. Truth has become elastic. Pilate says, what is truth? Many people are asking that. Jesus said, let me give you the backstage. It's just not coming out of nowhere, these questions. There is a side of truth and a side of anti-truth. That anti-truth is coming from the, the leader of the dark spiritual world to present all these things to us. And then Jesus said, truth not only exists, truth matters. Because when we obey the truth, when we get on the side of truth and we begin to see life as it is with God behind all of it, then we begin to say, man, things are going to begin to open up. Jesus said this. We sang it earlier to the Jews who had believed him. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It only is then these moments where we like, mm, now I get it. Those moments come from God. God reveals himself to us. Sometimes if you come to a church or you're watching a church service online, you think, I've got to muster up something enough to believe like it looks like everybody else is believing. And maybe I'm not quite with it yet. The idea of truth is not that you muster yourself up to believe enough and have enough faith to, be, to have truth in your life. The activity of God is always to begin with God, not yourself. So you come to God and you say, God, will you reveal truth to me? Because when God begins to unfold and open that curtain and you begin to, to see truth, that's when change begins. That's when transformation begins. Not because you've mustered up enough faith. You need to ask God, God, would you open yourself? If you are exploring God, I invite you to that invitation to God, that openness to God, that, 
that, that maybe that fresh prayer that you got, r- rather than our Father who is art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Great prayer. But your prayer in this intersection of your life is, God, would you reveal truth to me? And God is faithful to do that. It matters then how we, as those who believe in truth and have truth and have embraced truth, it matters that we, sh- that, the res- that we understand the responsibility in a culture where truth is elastic. What are we going to do with it? It's our responsibility to say, hey, I've got to share this. I can't keep this to myself. Thomas Aquinas said these words, as a matter of honor, one man owes it to another to manifest the truth. One man, one woman, one person owes it to another. If you've ever been offended, if you're searching for God, ever been offended by someone sharing the gospel with you, I understand that. I was. I didn't come to Christ. I didn't exchange my old life for Christ's new one until my, in my 20s. And it used to turn me off when people, you know, the Jesus people would come after me. And there was a trumpet player that would, you know, he would, he had this, I love the Lord, a uh, little sticker on his trumpet case. And I honestly, I thought, what an idiot. And then he would start talking to me about Jesus. I'm like, oh gosh, here he come. Then I'd see him coming down the hallway, you know, in the practice rooms. I'd just go the other way. I can't wait to see him in heaven to say two things. I'm sorry the way I've treated you. And second of all, thanks for having the guts to share the truth with me. Truth matters. Sometimes again, we you know we live in a culture where people that you know they they appear that they're telling you the truth, but they're not. Like for example, I got a lot of pictures this morning. I saw this. Sorry, I only have one B suit. I'm sure you'll be fine though. <laughs> this is the way culture feels. Like, hey, don't worry about it. There are many paths to God. It feels so groovy, right? It feels so warm. It feels so fuzzy. It feels so non-judgmental. It feels so non-dogmatic. The problem is there is only one Savior of the world who had the perfection as the Lamb of God to lay his life on a cross. It wasn't narrow-minded. It wasn't dogmatic. It was the beauty of compassionate simplicity where God said, let me make this easy for you. There is one Savior. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That is the plan of God. It's so that easy. If that seems narrow-minded, again, and, and love, I would say, I'd just ask God. That's how I started. God, okay, I'm just looking for truth here. And God loves to, to share that truth. There's a challenge in our culture as Christ followers to share truth. There's a, there's a couple of challenges. First of all, truth can be argumentative, right? When you go to share truth, all of a sudden it can stimulate, you know, the, it can stimulate arguments. It can sti- stimulate quarrels. And I think that's why we kind of, we veer away from it. We don't follow the Thomas Aquinas, you know, hey, it's our responsibility to share. We're like, well, you know, I don't want to tick my neighbor off, right? I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, make anything upset the cart. That's why, like, when we're together, I never say Tom Brady is the best quarterback in the league. That's I don't want to, I mean, I know it's truth, but I don't want to, you know, make anyone. Second Timothy chapter two, I know I just lost half of you, but uh, second Timothy two says this, and the Lord's servants must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. We're not here to to get people in a headlock until they get it, right? And then they will come to their senses. Okay, I want you to file that. And then escape the trap of the liar who has them captive to do his will. Do you see how big backstage is? We just think, hey, I shared something with my neighbor and he got ticked off. Oh, no, no, no. There's a lot going on behind the stage. I, I, let me read it again. It's too, it's, those who oppose him, must, we must gently 
instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, like, oh man, I've got to, I'm going this way, I gotta go this way. And leading them to to not church, not leading them to, to your favorite thing, but leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And then they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the liar, the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. That I, there's so much in that. I mean, we could park on it, right? But I thought when I was reading that, that whole come to the senses, that is the moment. That is the moment. When we are sharing truth as Christ followers, it's not how uh, elegant you can say the truth. It's not how theological you can say the truth. The truth is that human beings, in the most simple form, the truth is that human beings are in a helpless condition, that we can't save ourselves, that Christ, because he loved us so much, came to earth in the form of God, fully God, fully man, put himself on a cross to absorb, to forgive all the sins of the world, past, present, future, so that we might have access, imperfect people with a perfect God, so that we can spend eternity with him and then impact the world with this knowledge of the truth. It's that simple. It's, it, there's nothing complicated about it. Well, I didn't say it right. God's got it. I'm not saying, you know, you can make it up, you know, make up truth. I'm not saying that. But how many times are like, boy, I really dropped the ball. You didn't drop the ball if you brought the gospel of Jesus in its most simple form. Now, if you are, if you're on the receiving end, maybe you're still like, hey, I'm trying to still figure this out. Again, what we see is there's this moment of truth. There's this moment of like, wow, I've come to my senses. I literally started going to church when I was two weeks old. I felt like I went to, from the labor room to the church. And my parents were faithful. I mean, faithful churchgoers, listen carefully. They would say of themselves, if they were here today, we weren't Christians. We were faithful churchgoers. They were doing what they knew to be right, and they were also doing what was culturally acceptable in, in that day. You went to church, right? I've told you before, in the South, you didn't go to church. People talk behind your back, you know, if they see your car in the driveway on a Sunday morning, they don't go to church, you know, so we went to church. Every single week, every single week for 18 years, we said what was called the Apostles' Creed, where you, it starts, I believe in God the Father, creator of, the, of heavens and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. I can still say it because I said it every Sunday, 52 weeks a year for 18 years. I can still say it. The problem was I, I had not come to my senses. I was saying I believe. It was the creed, creo. I believed it. Uh, you know, I, I was saying I believe, but I didn't. Not until May 2nd, uh, 1982, like, wow, how come I've never heard that before? Do you know how offensive that is to parents? How come you didn't tell me about the gospel? You mean every week of your life for 18 years? This is why... It says they will come to their senses. So it reminds me of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And I'm here starving. I will set back. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn directions. I will, I will set back, go to my father and say, father, I've sinned against you. When it says, he said, he said to who? He said to himself. He said in that moment, he said, man, I, I've got to, wait a second. What am I doing here? That is the moment that you have got your sails fully turned toward God. It's not because someone said it in such a convincing way. It's not in such, it, it is the internal revelation of God in your life. That's what's going on behind the scenes. You may be sitting here literally this morning saying, why in the world am I sitting in a church? God is drawing you. 
Let me save you a lot of time. I wish that someone had told me that. God is drawing you. God wants to reveal himself. God wants to reveal the path that you can find him. God wants to reveal to him, to you, that God loves you, that he loves you so deep. It's deeper than the Pacific. It's higher than Mount Everest. It's so deep, and God wants to just take you and embrace you and say, I how could I prove it anymore? I've come to earth. I've walked in your dirt. I've put myself on the cross and I've died for you. That's, how, that's the message that God wants to say to each of us. It's crazy that we, we resist truth, but here's one of the reasons why. Here's what the Bible says. The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to say. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. It's really crazy how, as human beings, we get something stuck in our head, right? We get something stuck in our mind, and it's really difficult to dislodge that. And people, I think when you go, when we speak with them, and again, maybe this is even you, that somebody has told you something and it feels good and it sounds good. And then we, we just stick with that. So I was watching Will of Fortune. It's a confession. <laughs> I am in Vegas. I'm thinking, hey, what the heck? You know, maybe. <laughs> nah. And so uh, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, this is so appropriate. Let me, let me just share it. Watch this. It's great. Hey! Yeah. The pointed desert? No, still time. The p pointed desert. <laughs> James, it's your turn. The pointed desert. No, you still have time. I still have time. I like to solve. Let me say it. The pointed it's desert. It's not the pointed desert. Oh, no matter how many times you say it. <laughs> the painted desert. There you go. Oh, that's a good, that's a <laughs> I was just going to give him pointed desert. He was so insistent on it. Yeah. Yeah, I heard somebody say, wow, yeah. <laughs> wow, on a lot of different levels, right? He said, I, you were so insistent, I almost just said, hey, let's just go with Point of Desert. That's the challenge of our culture. Because if we say it enough, if we just say it enough that God didn't create man and woman, if we just keep saying it, it's shocking how culture will just start believing it as if it's truth. And that's just one of many topics, by the way, not a hot spot. If we just keep saying the pointed desert, okay, well, let's go with the pointed desert. See? And it's challenging for us because we're reading here. We'll suit our own desires. Now watch this. It gets a little more heavy. But it, it becomes liberating, okay? For us that we, if we've embraced truth, Christ is the truth, right? He said, I'm the truth, the way, and the life. Let me speak to you for a second, Christ followers. I know, being in my position for so many years, that sharing the truth of the gospel is a challenge. We're afraid that people are going to get quarrelsome. We're going to look narrow-minded, this, that, and the other, whatever. we got our own excuses, right? But one of the th excuses is, so for so many believers in Christ, I am not theologically prepared to share the gospel. I don't know the Bible. What if they ask me about creation versus evolution versus the spore theory? What if they ask me, yeah, but how come this faith and this faith, how come they can't be the same? Or they're going to ask you one of the big questions, right? And then you're going to look foolish. Today at the baptism, we saw the answer. And the answer is this. The answer comes in the power of your testimony. Should you know the Bible? Absolutely. But I, wanna, I want you to be confident walking out the door 
that you don't have to be a Bible giant to say, I was blind, but now I can see. I can't, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about other religions yet. That's great. You should learn it. There, no, no problem. I, I, progressively, we're learning, right? We're learning together right now. I, I get that. So I'm not under underestimating the power of learning and know the Bible, okay? But I know our culture well enough, our Christian culture well enough, to know that the liar behind and backstage, he wants to paralyze you and your effectiveness because you don't see yourself as a theological giant. Breaking news. I don't either, to be honest with you. I don't e I, I am not Mr. Theology. I'm not like in my office. I know people think pastors, you know, got stacks and stacks of books and we know all this stuff. I you'd be surprised. I'm probably not at how I how much I don't know, <laughs> guys. It, it's total idiots showing sure will of fortune on Sunday, man. It's a good crackpot. So, and he just came from Vegas. So, <laughs> you see, watch this Revelation, um, chapter twelve, uh, for the accuser. Of the brethren, that says Romans. Sorry, that's a misprint. Hey, I've been in Vegas. Give me a break. Um, <laughs> for the accuser of the brothers, who accuses them before God, our God, day and night. Did you know that? Did you know that's going on behind the scenes right now? That the enemy of the world is accusing you. See there? A lot of backstage stuff. For the, he accused, he's been hurled down. And these believers in this time, in this context, they overcame by the salvation and their trust in the blood of the Lamb of God and by the word of their testimony. I'm so grateful, literally. You have no idea how grateful I am that, that, that the Bible doesn't say they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and their keen, astute level of theology. Nothing wrong with theology. For those of you who are the theological, and, and no, don't get angry with me and save your emails. I probably couldn't understand them anyway. It would be so theological, right? <laughs> save it. I'm not under, I'm going to say it again. I'm not underestimating the power of learning, but we can't be captive or uh, captured because we don't know everything. Here's the powerful thing about a testimony. If you are a true Christ follower, you have one. You have one. I have one. You have one. They were saved, overcame by the blood of the land and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to keep it to themselves, to shrink in death. That's why John was on the island. He was the writer of, of Revelations. How he got there in the first place. Watch this. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom, Revelation chapter 1, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos. He was exiled because of the word of God and the testimony that I had of Jesus Christ. So the testimony is so powerful. Watch this. You remember Lazarus. Jesus raised him from the dead. And, and watch the testimony. Watch the power of testimony. John chapter 12. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came. Not only because of Jesus, but also to see a dead man who come back to life. Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the religious leaders, the chief priests, made plans to kill Lazarus as well on account of of him. Who's him? On account of Lazarus. On account of Lazarus saying, dude, I was like dead, man. And look, <laughs> I'm alive. I was literally dead. Not literally. Oh yeah, I was. Oh, your heart didn't stop beating. Oh yes, it did. My eyes weren't blinking like it does in the movies when they're trying to play dead. <laughs> I was dead. And look, I'm alive on account of Lazarus, 
many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him because of the power of a dead man saying, I was dead, but now I'm alive. Guess what? From a spiritual point of view, every Christ father has this testimony. I was dead, man. I mean, I had no purpose. I had no life internally. I had no life eternally. But I got to tell you, I can't even explain it to you. But I'm alive now. I have what the Bible refers to as Zoe, a life that I didn't know. Do all things go my way? Boy, I wish they did. My furnace still burns out. But I still have life inside of me. This is our testimony to the world. Now, we close by like, what does this have to do with silence? Here's the power of a testimony. When we speak truth and say Jesus is the only Savior of the world, People will quarrel with that. But over and over in the Bible, you see testimonies bring about silence. Because you can't argue with a testimony. There's a power of, of a testimony. There's a power of, of these moments where someone says, hey, I don't know, man. I was blind, but... I can see now. What do I got to say about that? Right? There was, a, there was a man who had been healed, Acts chapter 4. Peter and John, they were seeing the power of God through them. The religious leaders were upset, just like they were with Lazarus. Those around, you know, they were upset with him because a lot of people were now finding the truth because of his testimony. And watch this in Acts chapter 4, verse 14. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with the, these guys, they had nothing to say. Silence. Silence. Why is it? Here's why I think it is. Let me make this proposal. Here's why I think a testimony, why in the book of Revelation they came by the word of, they overcame by the word of God, the blood of the Lamb, and their testimony. Testimony is truth with skin on. Testimony is, here's the evidence of the truth. Here's the evidence that truth is just not a concept. Here's the evidence, like I'm telling you, it's not, it's like somebody dropping a lot of weight. Like, hey, what are you going to ask? Hey, what'd you do? Right? Well, I, I started exercising more. and no, that don't work. Apparently it did. I stopped eating chips and sodas and, you know, Burger King. Well, that ain't going to work. Well, apparently it did. In other words, what I chose to do, it is, it is evident. You see, I used to like this and this and this and this, and now I've lost my appetite for that. What human being has the power to do that? I used to be a, just enthralled by finances and how wealthy I could get, but now God's done something internally in me. And I sold my business. Who does that? I'll tell you who does it. People who were dead and had no life, and there was new life coming in to them, who now can see. How can you argue with that? It's truth with skin on. People that knew me in high school would be shocked, shocked at the life that I began to live in my 20s. Shocked. Dude, this was the party animal. This was the, the, you know, the life of the party. I know it's hard to imagine. You still are. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll pay you five bucks after this. Let me just end by reading this whole context, okay? Then we'll close. This is Acts chapter 4. We just took an excerpt out. Let me just read this and then we'll, then we'll close. Because this is encouraging to you, Christ followers, okay? For those of you that are exploring God, the encouragement is this. The encouragement is this all day long, every day. You don't have to muster up enough good behavior to be okay with God. You trust in Christ for your forgiveness. You don't have to muster up enough 
belief or faith. You trust God for that and say, God, would you bring me clarity on truth? It's all about God. It always is about God. Religion says it's about you. No, this is all about God and your dependence in God. And for us who are Christ followers, who have already made that choice, that decision, that exchange of life, the onus is on us. We're irresponsible, if I might be so honest, and say if we're holding the greatest truth of all life existence and we don't share. And every single one of us are everyday folk. There's, we're everyday folk. I'm an everyday folk. You're an everyday folk. Ordinary. Watch the power of how God uses people. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, these people, these guys who were speaking truth and realized they were unschooled, everyday, ordinary men, they were blown away because religion had convinced them that only the experts get to speak for God. They were astonished. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see this man who had been healed standing there with them, they had nothing to say. They were silenced. So they ordered them to withdraw from the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. Hey, what are we going to do with these guys? Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they have done an outstanding miracle, and dang it, we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further, that's the backstage motive here. To anyone in his name, we must warn these men never to, just to shut up. That's your enemy's motive, just to shut up. Then they called the men together and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But G both Peter and John said, hey, you got to judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. But for us, we cannot help speaking. Watch, not about our vast theology, but we can't stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. That simple. Amen. Just that simple. How did God create the world? Dude, I, don't st I still don't know. But I know... I know there's one that did. How could he absorb all the sins on the cross? I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, once you've seen it and heard it and you feel your soul freed, you'll know it. That's how simple that can be. And if you're asked a deeper, big life question, there are three words that will get you a long way. I don't know. I don't know, but here's what I do know. I was dead, and now I'm alive. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you. We're grateful, God, that you use us. It's, that's amazing in and of itself, that you use us for your kingdom purpose. God, you could have done it all, and yet you're channeling through us the, your message. You are... You are spreading, distributing, dispersing truth through human beings who have, who have had that revelation, God, of what true things are. Thank you for your compassion. Knowing, God, we live in a theater with a front stage and a backstage. And for those who have come or are listening online, maybe they're in their home, their car, their kitchen, Maybe they're at work sometime this week. And I think, man, this is blowing me away. Listen, it's God who's blowing you away. It's God who's revealing himself. And it is mind blowing that in this life, that the liar of this, this whole operation has convinced us it's all about front stage. It's all about the stuff you see. It's all about your job, your home, your health, all those things that we can see. But listen carefully, the truth of the matter 
is that there's a backstage to life. And that's really where truth happens. God is revealing himself to you if you find yourself searching for God. And in this moment, I invite you to say to God very openly, very honestly, even in this moment, God, would you reveal truth to me? Would you reveal yourself to me? I'm trying to find you. Would that be your prayer? God, I'm trying to find you. I'm trying to figure it out. And if that is your prayer, let me speak to you directly while we're in this mode of prayer, very briefly, because it's simple. The message of God is simple. It cost him a lot. The meaning is profound, but the message itself is simple. You're broken. I'm broken. Every human being is broken. Don't need a lot of proof on that. You're imperfect. I'm imperfect. The world's imperfect. Perfection and imperfection cannot come together. God is perfect. So he made a way by sending his son, the perfect lamb of God, to die for your sins, for your imperfections, your mistakes, your shame, your guilt. And on that cross, something, listen, something miraculous happened beyond the capacity for any human being to understand. But God put his son on a cross to absorb your sin. That means to take it away, to transfer it off of your soul onto the cross to be forgiven. Think about it. Not just in this moment in a church service, but to be forever forgiven, to be forever okay with God, to be forever in relationship with God. To bring new life inside of you that you've never experienced before. And your life will have its ups and downs in your valleys, but the main difference is that you'll be in relationship with God. If this is deeply resonating with you, listen, this is, this is the truth from the Bible that God is revealing to you. And here's the truth, just like we saw in the prodigal son, who in this internal moment, all to himself, he said to himself, I've come to my senses. If you're experiencing a moment like that, like never before, Listen, this is the opportunity for you to say to God, I want to be in relationship with you. So instead of depending on anything else, any junk mail would say, trust me, any religion that says, trust me, any modification of, of behavior to be good enough to be okay with God that says, trust me, don't do it. Trust in Christ alone. Let him take your sins. You can't work them off. Let him take your sins. Put your faith. Say, I, to God, I put my faith, my dependence, my trust in Christ alone. Embrace Jesus. Say, oh God, I want you. I want, I want to exchange my old life. I'm, I'm turning my boat around. And I'm, I'm going to exchange it. I'm turning it in. Like I'd go to the store and turn something. I'm turning in my old life, God. And I'm asking for a new one. Is that your prayer? Do you want a relationship with God like never before? Trust Christ. Turn your life towards him. Bring your brokenness. A big heap of it. And watch God, watch God remove that guilt and shame and weight from your shoulders.
others. Watch God heal your, your soul. Watch God bring life to you. Watch God bring sight to you that you've seen things backstage you'll never see. Watch God. Oh, give your life to him. Thank you, Father, for truth. We'd be completely lost without the compass of your word and your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, today. Thank you, God, that the power of our testimony, every Christ follower has one, that that brings silence, no quarrels, because it is truth with skin on. We love you for that. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.